Looking out the window of my transatlantic flight, I watched the vibrant city of Brussels grow smaller. I was inconsolably sad and was agonizing over the thought of losing my friends. I could still feel on mine the arms that were wrapped around me only moments earlier and hated my parents for making me say goodbye to all that I loved. With my insides torn by heartbreak, I held on to the last images of my life up until then. Because I was only 18 and originally refused to follow them, my parents bought a round trip ticket for my friend Virginie, who was to help me transition into our new American life. I vividly remember sitting in my scratchy and bright colored airplane seat, absently puffing on a Marlboro light. <laughs> yes, it was 1994, so we could still smoke on planes. And yes, I was only 18, but I was a Euro. <laughs> Anyways, I was smoking and daydreaming. The future was exciting, but I wasn't ready to part with everything I knew. I wasn't ready to grow up. Tears welled up in my eyes as I sensed the caress of claustrophobic sweat forming on my temples and felt an immense compulsion to run back home. Of course, the plane was already high in the sky and turning back was not an option. Virginie saw my distress and broke the deafening silence. It's going to be okay, love. We'll have fun, meet some hot guys, and you'll come back with me if we, you decide it's not for you. Bruxelles, Newark, Newark, Las Vegas. So read our itinerary. That morning, I rose a Belgian girl and went to bed that night an American or so I thought. It is a strange feeling to uproot like this, to not only change country but continent as well, having to adapt to a different culture, even if that culture seems quite similar to your own. I was surprised at the division of sex. Men and women seem to live on separate planes in the US. Furthermore, there was all this mention of races, the blacks, the whites, the Latinos, the Asians, and the natives. Nobody seemed to like each other, and all felt superior. I felt frozen behind this unnatural color separation. I didn't understand it, how could I? And then, everybody said hi. People smiled to one another in the streets. Waiters introduced themselves and asked me how I was doing. I couldn't help but wonder, what the hell is wrong with them? <laughs> Nobody cares this much. <laughs> Within the first week of our migration, I approached my father, demanding why he would approve us and force us to join this weird, racist, and cult-like country. <laughs> but, but instead of giving in to my judgmental behavior, he reminded me that the only way to survive this divergent culture was by ad adopting its customs. I was the one who was strange, a stranger by definition. It was most challenging to accept the fact that I was the one who had to adapt, me not the people around me, solely me. But I liked who I was. I was cool. <laughs> I, was, I felt as beautiful as any 18-year-old should. I was invincible. Nothing could stop me. I was ready to embrace the new challenges ahead and was looking forward to climb the imaginary mountains of obstacles, separating me from finding my spot in the new world. So there I was on that mid-90s fall evening full of youth's ideal, full of hope, and most importantly, full of myself. <laughs> I was equally fearful and fearless because I knew that I was going to take on this new world and become someone. The first step on my agenda was to make friends. I did not speak English, so I wasn't going to go to school, which really was demoralizing since I left seven months before getting my high school diploma. And I wasn't 21, so my prospects were going to be limited. Thank you so much, God, for wanting me to wait another three years when I just turned legal in Belgium. <laughs> but thankfully, my 25-year-old friend had a brilliant solution in mind, and the 1976 on my passport quickly became 1970. Hello, Las Vegas Nights. <laughs> <laughs> it was on an evening out with Virginie, that first month in the States, then I came across a handsome Navy officer who looked a lot like A.C. Slater from Saved by the Bell. <laughs> a GI, I thought. How exciting for a European girl to meet a real-life American hero, one of the likes of MASH or Platoon. <laughs> Slater and I were instantly inseparable. <laughs> Needless to say that I chose to pursue my life in America and bid adieu to my dear friend Virginie at the end of her stay. 
Within two years, the sexy soldier and I were married and had a beautiful little slater of our own. My husband was supportive. He taught me English, pushed me to get my GED, take ESL classes, and even go to college. I immersed myself in the American culture and felt empowered. I was happy and bilingual. But unfortunately, with knowledge came grief. I finally understood what people were saying to me for the past two years and felt the harsh stink of judgment. How come they're making fun of me? Wait a minute. I thought I was a cool Belgian girl everybody wanted to be friends with. <laughs> People's real colors unapologetically show when they don't realize that everything they say is understood. I would catch my husband's co-workers make comments such as, where did you find her, Russia? Couldn't get yourself an American bride, right? Or, man, she's so young, she'll leave you as soon as she gets her paper. Let me be precise. My husband was only five years older than me, and I came into this country already owning a green card. But what got to me most were the constant jokes insinuating that my accent was proof of poor intellect. The majority of people seemed to believe they had to slow their speech when addressing me as they would a toddler. Hello, how are you? Might as well have asked me, would you like a binky, little princess? <laughs> Every mistake I made was pointed out repeatedly. Laughs and mockery were a constant. What did she say? Not very smart, is she? Ugh, this is so annoying, in reference to me asking someone to repeat themselves. And my grand favorite, the mimicking of my accent and cultural generalization. Hello, je suis Pépé Lapieu. Voulez-vous coucher avec moi ce soir? which is completely out of line when you know that it translates to, would you like to fuck? <laughs> I can still hear the consoling words of my young husband. Don't worry about what people say, you're perfect as you are. I honestly tried to not ingest the string of attack on my character and culture, but it felt impossible. The unfortunate truth is that you can only hear something so many times before you start believing it. I am sure that the jokes and comments were not meant to be as harmful as they were, but the fact is that I soon stopped believing in myself and accepted the distorted truth that left me inferior. I no longer saw a pretty, smart, confident girl in the mirror and gave up on my new dream of graduating college. After all, if people laughed every time I opened my mouth at work or had to ask me, what, don't you speak English? While rudely rolling their eyes, how could I possibly look at myself in the mirror and say, you got this, Natasha. You can do this. I don't think that people realize how deep the scars of judgment lay. How we thought the constant belittlement of my marriage, maybe we wouldn't have divorced. How by making me feel stupid when I was trying to progress, they halted me, left me stagnant. How it took me years to regain my original, original identity and we learned that pride, when not condescending, is powerful. They didn't know that they molded me into one of them judging them before they could judge me, leaving me a pawn in their mind games. Years later, as I stood proudly watching my son graduating high school, holding my high-spirited daughter in my arms, I finally understood. I understood that denying my self-confidence was stifling hope. I realized that letting others define me was the silliest behavior, and that I was still, as I have never stopped being, a smart, beautiful, important woman. How could I have let people that mattered so little to me thus influence my self-perception when the ones that mattered most were standing in front of me, looking at me, their eyes sparkling with love, as proud of me as I was of them. So I took all the good, some of the bad, and reinvented myself. I decided to get reacquainted with my lost dreams and use the stink of past judgment as fuel for recovery. Most importantly, the last time a good friend of mine said regarding my studying English literature, well, you'll never speak like us, how could you possibly ever teach it? I smiled knowing that I will, because I, in the words of my favorite French author Voltaire, cultivate my garden. Thank you.